their microphones and switch your cameras off and then when we come to the Q&A and networking at the end you can uh, switch your cameras back on and uh, and obviously unmute when you ask a question. Um, just a reminder this is being recorded so um, the, the order of proceedings this evening is um, I'm going to hand over to Lady Hale in a minute who's going to say a few words of welcome um, I will then do a formal introduction to our guest speaker this evening, Michael Sosso, um, and then uh, Michael will deliver his lecture. I'm sure he'll be open to questions at the end of it. And then we will have some uh, sort of virtual networking and so you can get yourselves drinks and things. And, um, and then we'll end the evening around about half past seven. So, um, so I'll hand, I'll hand over to Lady Hale, who was the former Supreme Court president in the UK and is our president, and we're very honoured to have her as a guest this evening. So Lady Hale, do you want to say a few words? Well, thank you very much, Ian. Of course, I would like to say welcome to everybody. I'm really sorry that we can't be in the smoking room at the Athenaeum Club, which is where we were for this event uh, last year. Uh, the smoking room where we're not allowed to smoke, of course, like every other room in the Athenaeum. Uh, there's the coffee room where you're not allowed to have coffee, and there's a morning room which isn't open in the morning. Uh, but nevertheless, the smoking room is a very pleasant venue for an event such as this. However, through the magic of teams, we are able to get together just as many people and we can have just as much fun. And I'm really looking forward to uh, learning uh, what uh, challenges uh, recent events have caused for the um, legal profession and how it has been able to adapt to them. So it's a wonderful topical subject. So congratulations for arranging it and many welcomes uh, to our speaker, uh, Michael Sosso, who tells me that he's actually in London rather than in the United States. But he could have been in the United States, which is all the wonder of the digital age for which we have to be so grateful. Anyway, thank you and welcome to everybody. Over to you, Ian, again. Thank you, Lady Hale. So uh, I'd like to give a really warm welcome to Michael Sosso. He's currently Senior Vice President of Legal for Gas and Low Carbon Energy as well as customers and products at BP. He leads a global legal team of 100 people responsible for executing legal strategy across a number of BP's core businesses, including global petrol and retail operations, um, and lots of other businesses it looks like in BP as well. He has significant experience managing legal risk, building and leading teams, addressing regulatory concerns, designing effective compliance programs, as well as conducting um, regulatory concerns and responding to and learning from investigations. Uh, Mike joined the Houston office of BP in June 2011 from the Washington DC office of Skadden, Arps, Slate, Mega, and Flom. Don't American law firms have wonderful names? Um, where he practiced in the firm's antitrust and competition law group. Prior to his current role, he previously held roles as Associate General Counsel for Danes Downstream and the Vice President for Ethics and Compliance, where he led the team responsible for embedding ethics and compliance across BP's businesses and regions. In 2013, he was a finalist for the Global Competition Review Corporate Council of the Year Award. In 2014, he was honoured by being selected for the Legal 500's inaugural list of top 100 corporate counsel in the United States. The Financial Times and Outstanding have named him one of the top 100 LGBT ex executives in the world. He's a frequent speaker on legal, ethics, compliance, diversity and inclusion, and antitrust and competition law topics. Michael received a BS in economics and a BA in political science from Arizona State University, and his law degree with honours from Georgetown University Law Centre. 
Uh, Mike currently resides in London with his husband, Brian, who, who owns a travel business. Bri Mike and Brian are passionate about travel, having visited over 85 countries um, and learning about other cultures. When not travelling or working, you'll often find Mike with a glass of wine or enjoying a nice meal with friends or his family. He is a passionate advocate for equality. He and his husband helped lead the effort to legalise same-sex marriage in the United States and testified in Washington, D.C. on this matter. He frequently speaks at women's rights and LGBT events. He enjoys cinema, architecture and current events. So, Mike, I'd like to uh, open the floor to yourself to uh, deliver what sounds like a very interesting lecture. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ian. And, and first, let me begin by thanking the Bar Association for Commerce, Finance and Industry for the invitation to engage in this conversation. Given the history of the Denning Lecture and some of the recent speakers, including Lady, Lady Hale, I was both surprised and humbled to be asked to share my thoughts with you. I expect this will be a bit of a different lecture than you've had in the past, and not merely because of my funny American accent. Rather than give a talk on a specific substantive area of the law, I thought I would take this opportunity to reflect on our profession more broadly and the change we've seen in our recent history. To say that 2020 has presented significant and unique challenges would be an absolute understatement. Indeed, COVID-19 has turned the world upside down with millions of lives lost, millions more forced into lockdown and a financial shock to our economy across the globe, not seen since the Great Depression. Governments, employers, and individuals alike are facing new everyday realities never experienced in the hope to manage through this pandemic, resulting in a profound impact, not just on people's mental and physical well-being, but also in the way we work. As COVID-19 spread across the globe, normalities and customs of many people's work life were immediately abandoned in an effort to protect people's health. A year ago, you would have considered me crazy had I told you masks would become a standard fashion accessory. Trousers large, largely would become optional while working. The average commute time would be reduced from the time it takes to walk from one room in your flat to another, and a thing called Zoom would replace many boardrooms and conference rooms. Well, we have to find moments of lighthearted humor like these amidst the impact of this horrible virus our world is undeniably different. And the legal profession, among many others, has involuntarily experienced one of its most rapid and extreme changes to how we do our jobs. Long before this pandemic, many industries and sectors experienced significant periods of transformation prompted by competition, technological advancement, or the opportunity to reduce costs, increase margin, or create additional value. From the assembly line in manufacturing to the printing press and publishing, some of these advancements have fundamentally reshaped industries. Yet the legal profession has broadly been insulated from major shifts, unquestionably slower to evolve than many other occupations or industries. That is not to say it has been entirely stagnant. We've of course taken advantage of aspects of technology and incorporated them into the delivery of legal services. And over the past few years, we even started to see new business models emerge with lawyers and law firms offering more services to create additional value and distinguish themselves from their peers. But before we get too far down the path of what has changed in the legal world, perhaps we should start with an overview of why our laws, the judicial institutions, and our profession generally are quite slow to evolve. Let's begin with the law, which is steeped in tradition, at times intentionally and at other times unintentionally reluctant to shift and transform. That is not always a bad thing. We need only look to stare decisis and judicial precedent to find extraordinary value in tradition within the common law system. The very idea that decisions of the past should inform future outcomes with similar fact patterns allows for both consistency and predictability. These are two characteristics that we can all agree carry great value. Yet what happens when society begins to outpace the law? Does the stability offered then become a liability? An archaic reminder 
of a past we had intentionally left behind, or even ignorance to a new world in which society has grown accustomed. One of the more painful areas where we witness the flaw in a system that is intentionally slow to evolve is when looking back on equal rights. During last year's Denning Lecture, Lady Hale discussed the journey women have faced towards equality in the law here in the UK. Whether when considering property law, family law, or even criminal law, through most of the 20th century, true equality in the eyes of the law was always just out of reach for women, despite society professing its virtues. And in my home country, the evolution of gay rights demonstrates how reliance on custom and history can actually frustrate progress. In 1986, the United States Supreme Court in Bowers v. Hardwick reaffirmed that states could outlaw sodomy and target homosexual acts. Justice White wrote on behalf of the court to claim that a right to engage in such conduct is deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition is at best facetious. It took a further 17 years for the court to overrule its Bowers decision when in, 20, in 2003, it decided Lawrence v. Texas and found that a law that prohibited private homosexual activity between consenting adults violated the U.S. Constitution. If gender and gay rights weren't enough, one could simply reflect on the racial injustices that the law has permitted over time to see how the law can neutralize or even hinder equality with past decisions and precedents acting as a heavy anchor, dragging behind a society at the cusp of progress. It isn't just significant issues like equality where history, tradition, and custom can lead to the law appearing out of date. There are a number of laws that remain on the books today despite being designed for a different era. In several jurisdictions in the United States, the authorities are permitted to detain in jail material witnesses in criminal cases indefinitely, even if they themselves have done nothing unlawful. In other states, it is actually unlawful to take too much time voting if there are people waiting to cast a vote. And here in England, it is illegal to enter the House of Parliament wearing a suit of armor or for people to sing profane or obscene ballads on the streets. You may think antiquated laws do no harm and are merely a source of trivia or humor. However, in 2015, the state of Oregon detained an immigrant who was a material witness for more than 900 days in jail without any allegation of wrongdoing. And in 1988, a court found that a dated Alabama law limiting the time in a voting booth to five minutes was disproportionately being used against black Americans. Laws that fail to evolve and become arbitrary or archaic still remain laws with, with the risk of discretionary enforcement. We might even advise members of the minority government to think long and hard about their choice of fancy dress during next, next year's Halloween celebrations at Parliament, and similarly discourage the cast from the Book of Mormon from rehearsing publicly in the streets of the West End, given the technical letter of the law. These all too frequent examples demonstrate the importance of ensuring our laws do not lag too far behind changes within our society. Now, hopefully this is obvious, but I do not mean to suggest that the entirety of the law or even a significant portion is flawed, nor that tradition and history are inherently bad foundations on which to base our legal reasoning. I firmly believe that the law provides significantly more justice than injustice, and that history and tradition are a source of value to ensure we can maintain stability. The downside is obvious if the law could evolve too easily and drastically without challenge. We must, however, continue to keep a watchful eye out for when the burdens and costs begin to outweigh the value and look for opportunities to hasten the evolution of the law where it is so clearly needed. As with the law itself, our institutions that write, enforce, and interpret those laws are similarly immersed in history, custom, and tradition. As an example, in the highest court of my home country, the United States Supreme Court, advocates on behalf of the government continue to wear mourning coats. The justices wear black robes, quill pens are placed on council tables, and the seating of the justices and formats of the arguments have changed very little 
in the 230 years since the court first assembled. As technology advanced and the world evolved, the court seemed to be frozen in time. The first photocopier didn't show up in the Supreme Court until late in 1969, two decades after Xerox invented the Model A, the first xerographic copier, and years after commercial photocopying became prevalent. While the rest of the world took advantage of a technological breakthrough to improve speed and accuracy of copying, because of custom and tradition, carbon copies were still being used in the court, with the junior most associate justice receiving the final, often blurry, carbon copy of a memorandum. The battle between tradition and sanctity of the institution on the one hand and modernization on the other can also be seen across Europe and the United States within the, most, within the robust debate that continues over the use of cameras and other recording devices within the courtroom. It was only earlier this year that the British Ministry of Justice indicated that cameras would start to be present to record judges' sentencing remarks in Crown Courts a step that was welcomed by broadcasters while simultaneously drawing reservations from the legal community. The significance of this move cannot be ignored. Not only were filming and photography banned in English and Welsh criminal courts, but even live sketching was prohibited, requiring artists to work from memory after leaving the court. To be clear, not intending to challenge specific laws or the bedrock of our legal system, nor question the customs and practices of our judicial institutions. As I already mentioned, there's undeniable value in many of these practices. I reference them only to highlight the strong foundation of history and tradition on which our profession is established. More than anything, these examples that reflect the gradual pace of change within the substantive law and our institutions may help frame why the legal profession as a whole may be slower to embrace change than other professions. But while there is undoubtedly value in our laws evolving at a deliberate, thoughtful, and perhaps slow pace, that can all, cannot always be said for our broader profession. Which brings me to where I'd like to spend the bulk of our time today, the practice of law itself, our profession. Like with the law, Intentional and enduring traditions must always be grounded in more than history. There must be a purpose or value to justify the way we work and to resist challenge and new ideas. What was should not always be what is, or indeed what will be. Over-reliance on tradition without reason stifles opportunity, creativity, and progress. So as we reflect on the developments across the legal profession, it's worth focusing on three separate areas, business models, technology, and culture. So first, business models. Perhaps because we've faced very few competitive threats to our business model, the practice of law has fundamentally remained largely unchanged for decades, if not centuries. Many will argue that what's not broken need not be fixed. Yet I submit from firms to in-house legal functions to individual practitioners, there is significant value in interrogating how we work to find opportunities to change and realize additional value. While our profession is hundreds of years old, we've only recently seen innovation in the core legal business model covering fees, scope of services, partnerships, and outsourcing. For generations, the traditional hourly rate has remained the dominant mechanism to charge clients for legal services. However, in recent years, firms and lawyers are finally starting to offer newer, creative solutions from fixed fees to blended rates to risk collars to other alternative fee arrangements. And as a client, it is refreshing to have more options for engagement. And those firms or lawyers that consider innovative fee arrangements are recognized for developing customer-centric solutions that satisfy our varying needs. More often than not, we're actually trying to balance several objectives when we hire external counsel, including obtaining quality guidance while also achieving predictable and cost-effective legal solutions. When instructing counsel, 
We also seek to align both of our interests to achieve efficiency and effectiveness in outcome, which is rarely done through an hourly rate model that can often have the perverse incentive of encouraging less efficiency. In my experience, those that stick to the traditional model are facing increasing competitive pressure from the more innovative lawyers and firms. And unless they begin to consider alternative fee arrangements, they may soon find themselves losing business. Other recent shifts in the legal business model have included opening lower cost offices or even fully outsourcing lower valued tasks and expanding services to include adjacencies such as project management, document production, ethics and compliance support, or consultancy services. These changes may be novel to the legal world, but would otherwise be considered dated in other industries. Our profession resisted these changes to the core of our business, often defending the, the law as unique, a noble institution that should remain protected from scrutiny or cross-contamination with more common business models. This protectionist approach that stalled some of the changes to the business model may have actually caused more harm than good as lawyers and firms are now realizing additional benefits by lowering internal costs and creating new value pools. The second area to discuss is technology, which has often been the source of innovation across industries and sectors. From precision robotics helping surgeons with medical procedures to trading houses using computer-assisted rule-based algorithmic trading to automatically place and execute thousands of trades per second. In almost all cases, technology has improved the performance of people's jobs, increasing accuracy and output and reducing human error. Yet the legal profession, more so than most others, has been insulated from significant transformation at the hands of technological advancement. Where we have seen technology integrated into legal services, its value is clear. Gone are the days when lawyers spent hours in a library with volumes of hardbound case law or treatises researching their arguments or trying to even understand whether the case law reference remains valid precedent. From the comfort of a computer, we can now conduct more thorough research and immediately see whether a particular case has been overturned, reaffirmed, or questioned by later matters. Technology has made research and preparation for our arguments easier and more accurate, and therefore we are able to do our jobs more efficiently and effectively. Though perhaps as a nod to tradition once again, law offices and courtrooms alike still remain adorned with legal treatises, either as a strange obligatory design choice or a reminder of a not so distant past when we didn't have the benefit of technology to help us with our jobs. Another area of the law that has seen technology not only enter, but become the standard is document review and production. Previously, a legal team might send dozens, if not hundreds of lawyers to a warehouse for weeks to review large document productions in an effort to identify key documents in the litigation. A seemingly compulsory hazing ritual that a lot of us went through as we entered this profession. Spending long hours on such a mundane task could hardly be considered developmental, and there could be no doubt that documents were inadvertently overlooked by tired junior lawyers. Today, OCR scanning and keyword searches have allowed us to more easily and accurately identify potentially relevant and privileged material. Indeed, an entire supplemental industry was born in the 1990s and grew in the early 2000s, specifically aimed to service the legal community around document review. Historically, our industry demonstrated some initial skepticism to these techno technological solutions, and frankly, continues to do so. When advanced artificial intelligence is suggested as an option to either complement or indeed maybe even replace some activities that typically reside with the legal professionals, our community has responded with more doubt than hope. Yet despite this reluctance, 
the proof points continue to increase for the value technology offers. Not only is there software that can very easily draft standard contracts with limited parameters defined by humans, there are now more complex programs that can interrogate data about supply, frequency of disruptions, historical price variations, and other factors to actually recommend updated terms when a contract comes up for renewal that might protect a party against potential downside risk. Although this technology is still nascent and is only as effective as the accuracy and completeness of the underlying data, the potential value to clients seems evident. Although there are some firms that are experimenting with new technology, it has not yet become the norm. A few firms are starting to develop in-house solutions or enter partnerships that are intended to develop new technologies or ways of working and help protect against potential margin erosion from new entrants. Some firms have even created incubators, divisions structured like tech startups with the mission to boldly pursue new ideas and to test, fail quickly, learn, and adjust. Others are partnering with actual tech startups, providing funding, office space, and the opportunity to test the effectiveness of their solutions with the firm's lawyers and clients. Still, many firms and lawyers consider these initiatives costly and fruitless distractions, throwing good money after bad. And as with many traditional startups, it's likely most of these ideas will indeed fail. But the value is not merely on the su substantial potential financial upside. It is also in the mindset shift that can occur within the firm and its clients when creativity, forward thinking, efficiency, and boldness are encouraged and rewarded. Which brings us to our third area, culture. As we've already discussed, the legal world is one established on tradition and custom. The result is that our professional culture is similarly slow to evolve. While I can understand the pace of change in the law or our institutions, I've grown frustrated with the hollow justifications for a work culture that is desperate for change. And here is where I might inject some controversy and challenge. Yes, we've made progress, but not nearly enough. Clutching to traditions and customs is actually harming our profession and doing a disservice to clients. Let's begin with an obvious area for improvement, diversity. Many of us have advocated for equality, arguing cases to right injustices, promoting legislation and regulations to advance gender parity, offering pro bono services to victims of discrimination, or serving on boards of nonprofits in this space. Yet as much as we're trying to make progress externally, when we look inward to our own profession, we see at best neglect with clear evidence of failure. At law firms, although females make up nearly half of all lawyers, they comprise less than 30% of partners. Looking at the larger, more prominent firms, the situation is even more dire with females making up less than 20% of the partnership of the top 10 UK law firms. Reports on the gender pay gap within our profession confirm the disparity already highlighted. And if you consider racial or socioeconomic diversity, the statistics show similarly poor results. Even if we can all agree there is a problem, we struggle to align on the underlying causation for that problem, and therefore never reach a real solution. Instead, we engage in intellectual debates and land on diversity ambitions that make us feel as though we're making a difference, but in reality have marginal impact. Diversity, or lack thereof, is likely both a cause and effect of our legal culture that requires close examination alongside a scrutiny of our basic working habits. We celebrate and reward long working hours. Bonuses at most firms are not tied to the value you create for your clients, but rather the hours you bill. 
We rarely question deadlines, priding ourselves on delivering and exceeding client expectations, even if a timeline is unrealistic or arbitrary. We're expected to be present, whether at an office, in a courtroom, or at a client meeting. And we share war stories about the all-nighters we've pulled in our careers, not with disgust, but rather wearing them as a badge of honor, as if they've made us a better lawyer. With these characteristics, is it any wonder why diversity remains a problem within our profession? Those individuals that want a better work-life balance or prioritize family over work will either opt out or will be selected out based on our own promotion standards. Focusing too heavily on certain qualities during hiring and promotion exacerbates the diversity issue and can ultimately lead to a loss of commercial value. We tend to find ourselves drawn to proven academics, Oxbridge and Ivy League educated lawyers. We look for social individuals, extroverts that can engage and relate to others with ease. The results is that many lawyers not only look alike, they think alike. That lack of diversity creates real commercial risk by increasing the likelihood of groupthink rather than generating new ideas and encouraging challenge that can result in an atypical approach with greater value. As an in-house lawyer, I consider myself lucky. We've become a viable option for those wanting to progress in a legal career in a very different culture. And if an individual lawyer's values are in conflict with the traditional legal or firm way of life, they may find more comfort moving in-house to a company with a more aligned culture. And at the very least, a place that celebrates and encourages diversity ensures someone that thinks or looks different can feel valued rather than try to conform to, prog to progress in their own career. Now, in my opinion, the in-house legal profession is probably one of the communities that embraces change the fastest, largely due to the fact that our culture is driven as much or more by our employer as the legal community itself. Whereas law firms can often be viewed as reliably uniform and predictable, the culture of in-house legal departments varies greatly from our office attire to work habits. And it shouldn't surprise you that some of the most progressive in-house legal departments sit within companies that are considered, considered novel and forward thinking. For example, Palantir, the technology and data analysis company. They abandoned the traditional titles uh, of their in-house roles and instead officially adopted the name of legal ninjas. Now, while some of us may consider the name quirky or even unprofessional, it intentionally challenges the customary legal conventions to encourage Palantir's legal team to focus on agility, speed, and original solutions, rather than hierarchy and traditional ways of working. The title alone likely attracts lawyers that want to execute differently. In contrast to traditional legal jobs, in-house legal jobs typically uh, offer greater flexibility an opportunity to distinguish oneself outside of billable hours. Within my legal team, the majority of our lawyers work flexibly, some officially part-time, others adjusting hours to accommodate child drop-off or pick-up to share parental duties with their partner, and still others working some days from home rather than coming into the office each day. Lawyers' performance evaluations are based on what they've achieved for the company not how many hours they've worked. As a result, part-time lawyers have an equal opportunity to achieve higher bonuses and overall reward, as well as promotion. This is quite common in the in-house legal world because it is part of the culture across many sectors and industries that actually employ us. We've seen the benefit of distinguishing our corporate legal culture from the traditional legal world. We find by respecting people's lives outside of work, we can attract some amazingly talented lawyers that struggle with the traditional legal culture. And although there is always room for improvement, the diversity of our legal team is stronger than that in many firms at every level. 
The majority of my leadership team is female, and we also have strong diversity on race, nationality, and leadership style. And as we've already discussed, increasing diversity also, I believe, yields better business results. Now, when discussing culture, I very purposefully began and ended with diversity. It is both a source of our cultural problems and a product of our cultural problems. It's a vicious cycle that requires transformative and bold thinking rather than soft diversity ambitions. If the cycle can be broken and pro progress made, the profession will not just look and feel different. New ideas and ways of working will emerge. Now, you may be asking why COVID-19 takes such a prominence in the title of this talk, yet hasn't been mentioned in quite some time. This pandemic has forced us to reconsider our traditions and customs and revisit some of our biases to change. In the midst of some of the most challenging moments of 2020, opportunity has emerged. As a profession, we may not have chosen to test new ways of working, but having been forced to do so, we should learn and grow from the experience rather than just return to our old way of working when this health crisis is behind us. COVID-19 has even forced both the law and some of its most traditional institutions to shift. Very valid questions arose about whether hard copy and wedding signatures were really necessary when it became a challenge during lockdown. The US Supreme Court, never before allowing live recording or broadcasting of arguments, began to hold oral arguments via teleconference and permitting them to be live streamed for the first time. If accommodations like these were made during the pandemic, we should ask whether there is value in continuing them, along with many others, even when we return to the new normal. Despite our apparent aversion to change and trying new things, the legal profession had no choice but to implement new ways of working over the past eight months. A forced experiment that has yielded plenty of data points to debate the various successes and failures. One of the first professional victims, presence culture. The view that we must be at the office or physically present to perform our jobs effectively has certainly been challenged. When in-person meetings and traditional office working was necessarily abandoned, we didn't stop working or fail, we adapted. Within BP, two significant M&A deals announced in the past few months were negotiated entirely virtually. In the past, our commercial teams in-house and external legal teams and the counterparties teams would have spent weeks in conference rooms for long hours posturing in a traditional negotiation, hoping to reach agreeable terms. The costs would not only include advisors' hourly rates, but also travel and human costs. And by human costs, I mean the toll it takes on our body and mind to be away from home, working more hours in a day than normal, without having our familiar routine that includes family, friends, exercise, or even a favorite coffee shop or pub to refresh and re-energize. The virtual format of these most recent negotiations seemed to be more structured. Although they required more pre-work, we completed the actual virtual negotiations at a quicker pace. Lawyers and commercial teams spanned a number of countries and even several continents. And while time zones offered some challenge, a number of the participants saw the value in working from their home location rather than traveling. Outside commercial negotiations, we've also seen some value in this new way of working. Commute times have effectively been eliminated. Rather than working standard hours, people have been able to generally adjust their hours to accommodate other obligations, such as childcare, household duties, or even just for personal preference. In a strange defiance, not being able to be with our colleagues has allowed us to grow closer to our colleagues in some ways, open into their other world by having kids or pets occasionally join a video call or seeing a piece of art or decoration in the background that prompted a personal story. Not working from the office 
has also encouraged lawyers, clients, and employers to find the most effective and efficient team to attack a particular problem, resulting in the globalization of teams and matters. Now, none of us are so naive to only see the benefits in this new way of working when there are some obvious downsides. While work hours have become more flexible and the line between home and work more blurred, employers, clients, and even the lawyers themselves may feel the need to constantly monitor, respond to requests, and effectively be on call 24 hours a day. Makeshift home offices rarely are designed with ergonomics at the front of mind, nor do they contain the technology or office resources normally found in traditional workspaces. Technology has undoubtedly become our greatest blessing and curse with insufficient bandwidth or Wi-Fi resulting in dropped calls. We no longer have the advantage of in-person meetings, random conversations that can take place at the water cooler or impromptu collaborations with colleagues. And quote, reading the room, a necessary skill during commercial negotiations and oral arguments and core to our profession has become increasingly difficult when you're not, in fact, physically in the same room. And although there is value to being close to your family, the expectation that we must juggle all responsibilities, whether personal or professional, simultaneously, rather than focus on one or the other, may add pressure or create chaos. It's not lost on me of the fact that the very format of this year's lecture provides us with yet another example of the costs and benefits of our current way of working. Yes, those that would not have been able to come into London today are able to participate. On the other hand, I certainly am finding it a bit of a challenge to speak to a camera rather than a room full of people. And it's also worth reminding you that a camera does add at least 10 pounds. <laughs> and while we'll have some virtual drinks following this talk, I'm sure we all would rather be together to network, as has been the case in past years. If our professional culture before was close to one end of a pendulum, the pandemic rapidly and forcibly swung it to the other extreme. And as with most things in life, the extremes carry both positives and negatives and rarely result in the optimal position. I do not believe any of us know what the new normal will look like when this pandemic becomes a memory. However, I hope we can learn from the experiences and transform to a new reality that minimizes the downside while leveraging the benefits we've seen. A year or two from now, I have a few predictions, or at least hopes, for our profession. One, we are neither working entirely from home nor entirely from the office. Instead, we thoughtfully consider what will drive the greatest value for individuals, as well as the clients, employers, or firms collectively. Some individuals will find greater value working mostly from home, while others will likely want to do nearly all work at the office. Flexibility, rather than a mandated approach, will allow us to realize the greatest value. Two, business models in the legal world and performance evaluations for lawyers will fo focus more on value delivered rather than hours worked. Alternative fee arrangements will become the norm and compensation structures that reward creativity, efficiency, and effectiveness more than time billed. Three, Technology is viewed as an enabler and an opportunity to enhance efficiency and effectiveness across our profession. We experiment and maintain an open mind, trying new technologies, not with the expectation that it is a perfect solution, but with the eagerness to find opportunities to improve, which will ultimately result in better legal services and solutions. And four, and most importantly, our flexibility, our focus on outcomes over hours, and our celebration of diverse thinking starts to attract and retain real diverse 
talent. The vicious cycle perpetuated by lack of diversity begins to break down and we find a virtuous cycle created with increasing diversity resulting in greater challenge, bolder change, and even more opportunities to transform. Given we do not know how COVID-19 will actually change our profession in the long run, perhaps this talk is a bit premature. As an optimist, however, I'm hopeful and confident that the profession will tackle the unique presented in the midst of this massive challenge. We will evolve because we were pushed outside our comfort zones and discovered some value where otherwise we might not have realized. And while we may not know every practical lasting impact of the last eight months, the most fundamental change has actually already occurred within our mindset. Rather than simply do the things the way they've always been done, we've opened our minds to challenging the way we work. And there is no doubt tradition and custom will remain a part of our pr profession. But our most recent history has challenged the precedence of years past. And even if our culture hasn't been entirely overruled, it has undoubtedly been questioned. And therein lies the opportunity to not be wedded to the past, but instead challenge ourselves to evolve and transform into the profession we want to become as compared to the one we've always been. Thank you. And Thank I am you. absolutely willing to take some questions. Yeah, I was going to say that. So uh, there's two ways to ask questions. You can either just um, say something with your mic on or uh, type a question in the chat box. So has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Michael? Looks I like uh, RP. Yeah. Oh, Michael, it's uh, uh, Ryan Porter here. Um, oh, hi, Ryan. Hi, Ian. I thought it was a bit in really enjoyable lecture, and thank you very much for presenting it to us. I'd like to take you back to one of your points, though. You mentioned the legal profession's reluctance to embrace artificial intelligence as much as other professions. Do you see any challenges, however? in abdicating responsibility to uncertain algorithms, which may themselves contain the very biases that we want to eradicate? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think uh, as artificial intelligence is tested, what I would encourage us to do is be open to experimenting with it. Um, I don't think it is going to be the solution immediately out of the gate. But what I do think is it could actually enhance the way we do our jobs. It could help us uh, perhaps focus uh, our legal teams and, and lawyers to focusing on the right area of a contract, for example. So testing un uh, underlying data, um, having it run through an AI type program, it will focus a lawyer on the two or three portions of a contract that are probably gonna be most relevant given the past experiences. Now, does that mean it is entirely conclusive and it's going to be right? No, but if you are looking for efficiency and if you are looking towards a model that is less about perfection, but more about focusing the efforts, uh, you know, putting 90% of your effort on the 90% of the contract or the 10% of the contract that actually makes the most difference, I think AI can help you with that. Uh, now, in terms of whether or not there are biases involved in AI, absolutely, and I think other industries are dealing with that. And it is one of the reasons why lawyers have to be involved in the design of the algorithms. Um, I am not in favor of having technologists develop this, and it's one of the reasons why I'm excited that law firms are actually starting to embrace some of these and work in partnership with the technologists. Having technologists do this in a absence of understanding the way the law works or the, what our clients need or, or what the legal problems are 
will result in technology solutions rather than legal solutions. And you actually need the partnership to actually combat any potential biases that may be there. Thank you. Um, we've got an interesting question from Suzanne Rees. How do you, sorry, it keeps just going up. How do you get people with a vested interest in keeping things as they are to give up power and embrace diversity and equality of opportunity to people who do not look like them? It's a good question. Yeah, uh, and if I had the answer to that, uh, that would have been the core of my entire conversation. We could have had an entire lecture on that. I don't know. Um, I, I think this is the biggest problem, and it's why I think the lack of diversity is both the cause and effect of some of our our, our problems uh, as a, a, a within our culture uh, of the legal world. Now, what I will say is every opportunity I have, uh, I do speak about the value of diversity. And I think if you throw diversity and you just force people to experience it, and they soon they then soon see the value it offers, they become buyers. Uh, so I think at first they view it as um, perhaps the moment that we're dealing with it in time or, or, or just a current problem and, and not really a, an issue. But when you actually present them with solutions and give them a data point, they then see the value it offers. So one of the things I now do and uh, some members of my, my team and across uh, the, the legal team at BP we do is when a, a law firm presents us with a team to handle a matter, we actually will go back and push for diversity on that team. And it's one of the ways that as a client, we can help force the evolution in the, in the profession. Now, some may argue that's bad because that means we're not allowing our lawyers to pick the best people they think could help us with a, a problem, but we always do focus on capability. And I would tell you more times than not, getting a diverse team has actually resulted in more promising results. And if we simply said, oh, well, that's the team that you presented with us that's the most capable, it actually just perpetuates the ongoing problem that diversity never breaks into it. So by forcing it and making them have a diverse team, um, we're also showing that the capability a diverse team can bring to solving problems for us as a client. Great. And we've got another question online from Ralph. Um, Retravel. While we've saved the human hours of travel, surely we cannot disregard travel overseas subject to lockdowns locally. It is good culturally and helps foster good relations. And those of us who speak other languages can practice our languages in the host countries. Yeah, completely agree with that. Uh, the, and it's why I don't think the pendulum, the way the pendulum has swung currently, I hope this is not the new normal. Uh, I, I, as, as you've heard during the introduction, I am a passionate traveler. I agree with getting out and uh, engaging with other cultures and learning about them. And, and frankly, um, meeting in person has tremendous value. Uh, so I am not suggesting that all negotiations or all meetings should now be taking place over teams. Um, I think what we need to do is reflect where does it make sense to have meetings virtually? Where can the value really be uh, you know, increased by traveling and having an in-person meeting, um, especially in light of the cost? So it becomes a more conscious cost-benefit analysis than it previously has been. I will tell you in the past, I, I would travel at least once a month. Now, in hindsight, knowing what I now know about the way we can work, it's given me pause to think, OK, how many of those meetings might I have been able to do effectively virtually? And I probably could have cut half of those trips out. So even reflecting on the past few years of my own career, I think I could have seen a change in my own travel schedule, which is good for the company and it's good for me personally as well. Um, Michael Blair says, are law schools on site or are they part of the problem? Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I think it depends on the law school. So I think there are, uh, 
I, I see some greater push for progress. Uh, so there are, and, and I'll speak to the U.S. because I'm more familiar with the U.S. law school system and, and some of the changes, but there are specifically new courses on legal technology. And they're actually teaching things about how you implement technology into the legal practice. So those courses are fantastic. Um, and I think they demonstrate that as those new individuals come up through the system, they're going to have a deeper understanding and probably embrace change a bit easier than some of our, uh, some of us that have been in the profession a lot longer than that. Now, uh, you know, I know in U.S. law schools, they, sh they still teach shepherdizing, though, and I don't know if you call it shepherdizing over here. Shepherdizing, so shepherdizing is actually going through, and it's, it comes from a shepherd. Uh, shepherd is in a book that used to be issued in the U.S., and there would be volumes of it, and it's how you would check to see whether case law was still valid, whether it was still active oh. precedent, and you would have to go through probably... 15 to 20 volumes to figure out how, whether a case law had ever been questioned throughout the course of uh, the, the whole um, experience. So that is still being taught in some U.S. law schools. Despite the way it's done today in any practicing law is you click a link and it says shepherdize this case in a, a U.S. Uh, site and it immediately tells you whether it's valid or overturned or has been questioned. Um, so I think they teach custom. And again, I don't think custom is entirely bad. I think it's okay to understand where we've come from. But I would prefer that we approach that uh, with the uh, curiosity of where it doesn't mean that we have to end up there. It's where can we get to. And I'm, I'm more interested in uh, folks that challenge the norm rather than those that just simply do something because it's the way we've always done it. We've got Ewan McLeod uh, who wants to ask a question. Ewan. Thanks, uh, Michael. You've actually answered the question I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask about your role at BP and how you can use that role to promote diversity in the profession when you're commissioning legal services. Um, I completely agree with everything you said on diversity. Um, I wonder if I could maybe uh, draw you out a bit further on that point and ask, do you have experience of instructing the bar in England? And is that a different experience from instructing larger law firms? Um, yeah. And you also touched on um, the, the work-life balance issues associated with legal practice. And I wondered if you had thoughts on the extent to which that was driven by uh, the lawyers or the clients and to what extent you think clients would be on board with a different approach to work life balance and, you know, banning all nighters and that kind of thing. Uh, so let me start with your, your first question. Yeah, I we do have exp uh, experience instructing uh, the bar here in the UK, and um, I would say that it's a bit more challenging, but I uh, I was at an event, actually, Lady Hale was present there, um, I believe it was right before lockdown, if I'm not mistaken, um, at uh, Norton Rose uh, Fulbright, where they hosted for arbitrators, um, and really to highlight female arbit arbitrators. Uh, and it was an opportunity for uh, a bunch of individuals to actually come uh, and just introduce themselves to various clients. Um, and it allows us to get to know a more diverse uh, uh, group. And I think we need to figure out more of those activities because when you're talking about engaging somebody from the bar, the default tends to be the names that are known. Uh, and so the diversity problem actually is exacerbated. And so to the extent that we can break that cycle by having some of these introductory meetings, I'm all for it. And I think uh, a number of us from BP and a number of other clients actually participate in those events where we can. Uh, we've also signed up to um, a pledge uh, on trying to drive diversity across the profession as well. Um, now, you know, I, I like 
again, what I want to see is more action on that. Um, and what does that mean? How does it, how can we make that more real? Um, so again, it's it's not just saying what we believe because I think we all believe there's this is righteous. It's a question of how we actually implement it. And so I, I'm looking for those opportunities. Now, your question on work-life balance. Um, I can tell you if, uh, you know, I, I, this is not going to, and I'm going to be careful how I say this, because again, I hope that I have um, very thoughtfully figured out what timelines are appropriate, but sometimes timelines are outside my control. And I would uh, be lying to this group if I said that some of our own internal lawyers at BP haven't had those moments where they had to work uh, longer hours uh, or seven days a week. We absolutely try to minimize it. And I would hope we're also trying to minimize it for external firms. And where we have to do it, I hope clients really it is a necessity. So it's either because there's a filing deadline or uh, there is some, some timeline that is driving and it's not just arbitrary deadlines. So where I've challenged it is, you know, I've seen, and I've done it myself. I've asked firms before for uh, an answer on a question by the end of the week, not knowing the amount of work that it generates behind the scenes and, and that it's causing somebody to work really long hours. And then I hear about it after the fact and I feel terrible. When if they had just said to me, well, how firm is that deadline? Because it, we actually could give you the better answer in two weeks rather than one week. I would have said fine. So I think it's that discussion that would be a bit more uh, helpful to reach the right answer. We are in a profession that will have its moments of hard work. We're a service industry. And I, I'm not suggesting we never work outside the normal hours. Uh, but I do hope that it can be thoughtful and it doesn't simply become a standard practice that we celebrate. Uh, I was going to say, uh, as an in-house lawyer, you've got to be mindful that in you, in us in-house lawyers trying to have our own work-life balance, we then just throw the work over the wall to one of our law firms and expect them to turn it around overnight. We've got to practice what we preach, Correct. haven't we? Correct. Great, thank you, thank you. And so Narinda uh, wants to ask a question. Narinda, do you want to ask <coughs> Mike? Yeah, hi Mike. Yeah, good good presentation. What I want to know is, what do you think the INS can contribute or play, the role that the INS can play in um, diversity? Um, so I'd be open to the que this question. Oh, let me throw this to you all. So I think the first thing we can do is have more open and honest conversations, um, which will help. But I'd actually, I'd like to hear from you all. You all have heard some of my thoughts. And, and does anybody have thoughts on this? I mean, how about you? Do you have uh, any thoughts yourself on what, what they can do? Yeah, I mean, I think they could be, you know, I, I've i thought on one or two boards of, of the in that I'm a member of, and I realized I was the only, um, well, I am, you know, Asian descendant, but I was sort of like really, really in the minority. And uh, especially in, you know, cultural discussions. I mean, I worked with a, a very international, international firm for over 15 years. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll call the name, it's not a secret, IBM. And I traveled all over the world. And the fact is, I understood the whole aspect of diversity. And I'm not waving a flag for IBM. I think we, the, when I was there, we practiced it. But I, I don't think the ends and, and possibly the bar council to a certain extent, they're playing, in my personal view, they're playing lip service to these things and they are not really addressing it as well as they should. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I, I, that's my fear is that this is a lot of it is lip service. And it's by the way, it's not just the ends. It's uh, I would 
argue firms, in-house uh, folks, we all should challenge ourselves, what more can we do? Um, I, I think getting folks like yourself to raise your voice up and, and uh, you know, speak up like you are is powerful, but we need more people to do that. Um, we have to, for some reason, yeah, the, the problem is people think promoting diversity and, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, on the face of it. And I know I have an element of diversity and I'm openly gay, but um, if you look at me, I'm a white American man. And when I, and it's one of the reasons why I speak, frankly, more passionately now about uh, women's rights and, and equality for women, because if I speak it, it tends to actually have a more powerful voice than if I speak about gay rights because they just assume I'm self-interested in that. Um, so I would actually encourage all of us to look for uh, a way of promoting a diversity that maybe we don't immediately see in ourselves because you're doing it for the right reason, which is getting even a different view than you yourself would hold into the conversation. Uh, uh, Amanda Pinto, who's chair of the bar, uh, has got raised her hand. Amanda, do you want to contribute to this debate? <laughs> I would. Um, thank you very much indeed. First of all, thank you so much for the lecture. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm disappointed to hear um, Nar Narendra say that we're paying lip service to um, diversity and uh, inclusion measures. And um, May I say, from my perspective, that is absolutely not what the Bar Council is doing. I'm not saying for a moment we can't do more. And any ideas that Narendra has, we would be delighted uh, for him to get in touch um, directly. Um, but what I can say is that during my year as chair of the Bar, we have um, not just um, extended the programmes that we are um, putting out, um, so that we now have a whole range of programmes to support women. Uh, and that is, as, as it were, a starting point, because I think once you've got the, the measures and the wherewithal and the, and the programmes uh, starting out for one um, issue, it's easier to uh, understand how you can roll it out uh, f further afield. And secondly, um, with regret, it was in uh, as a result of the killing of George Floyd, but we very quickly moved to um, put in place a race working group. Um, and frankly, far from doing lip service to this, they've already, I mean, bearing in mind that, that the killing was in the summer and bearing in mind we're in a pandemic, um, they have already uh, published an action plan for chambers and other um, bar associations, chambers, etc., to be able to address issues on race. So we're looking at the data. We are frankly cutting cutting the data to see what needs to be done. Uh, every time some more data that's unsatisfactory comes out, we try to address it. We certainly don't hide it. Um, and it's also right to say that the BSB uh, are taking steps as well. So. I'm, I'm sure there's room for improvement, uh, but I but I do think that we are going in the right direction. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Amanda. And by the way, I, I think Amanda referenced data. Um, to me, the fact that we are now asking for all this data, that is gonna make a huge difference because when you see the data, you realize the problem and you can start to see whether you're making progress or not over time. And it's one of the reasons why I'm, uh, you know, I know the legal profession. Uh, you look at the gender pay gap uh, figures, and it's it's not great for our profession. Um, but it's great to see the reports that are coming out. Now, I do think we need to get better about how honest some of those reports are, because there are some firms that I know that are uh, removing partners from some of the analysis and only working at associates. But the more honest we can be about that data means the more honest we can measure whether we're making progress or not. Narinda, do you want to comment? <laughs> um, I mean, the thing about it is, you know, I 
I know that they're doing uh, and all organizations and everybody is, is doing things. And, you know, Madam Chair, thank you. You 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 mentioned the fact about women and that's I mean, I remember there was going back 15 years and again, I must go back to IBM. There was a lot of uh, things there where, you know, women were being promoted to positions and there's never I was never a, a problem with that. The, and, and I've had issues with my team because I was a I managed uh, lawyers, male, female, right across um, Europe. And I had to deal with situations with uh, pay gaps with certain lawyers, female lawyers. And I dealt with it with putting my job and my head on the line. So I have actually have experience and, you know, someone and everyone who knows me, I, I I speak my mind all the time. And but the fact is, I don't think enough is being done by the ins and the bar council. And and ma Madam Chair, I, I understand that things are being done, data is being uh, sifted, but I, I think we need to light some fires and get things done more quickly. It is my personal view. Can I say something? Thank you. Ewan, have you got another comment to make or if you still take your hand down? <laughs> uh, no, I, I do have another comment to make. I just wanted to um, to respond to what um, Amanda said. Um, I, for those who don't know me, I should have said when I spoke earlier that I'm from the Bar Standards Board. Um, and as Amanda said, we've, you know, we work closely Sorry? with the Bar Council on these issues. Just um, and we've, um, we also have a race equality task force and um, for those who are interested, last week we published uh, an anti-racist statement for the bar. Um, and what we're acknowledging is that um, whilst we all have good intentions, in order for that to make a difference, we actually have to translate that into practical steps in the profession to move diversity forward. Um, so we made a number of recommendations for um, barristers' chambers to do things like uh, race equality audits to better understand uh, the the dynamics within their sets to see how they can uh, promote diversity. Um, and we've recognised in that that there's potentially a role for employed barristers also, who obviously are in a slightly different situation, but um, there's a role for anyone at the bar to advocate for uh, equality and diversity in whichever organisation they're a part of. Um, so I'd, I'd urge everyone to have a look at the, the statement that we published on Friday. Um, and I, you know, we'll continue to work with the Bar Council, the INS and others to try and translate some of that into practical change. Good. Well, I could, think... I, could I say something, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'm Ashitao Laney. I, um, I'm a head of chambers of uh, chambers called Redemption Chambers. I've been at the bar since 1981. Um, now, I'm one of the few ethnic minority people that has been to uh, prep school and public school in this country. Um, the problem is that there's no doubt at all that the Bar Council, the BSB uh, 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 and the INS are desirous to have a change. The problem really is one of is societal, if I may put it in this way, because um, the way that I see it is that, particularly at the independent bar, you get work from people that you know. And that happens because people know each other because they either been to school together or they've been to, or, or they, they move in the same circles. That is the difficulty. Most of the ethnic minority people who come to the bar don't have that sort of network. And that's what makes the difficulty. And until we change that in society, there's still going to be these discrepancies and these these problems. So, yes, I'm not saying don't give up. Of course, keep doing it. But you've got to realize that it's not just from the top there. You have to start off at the schools and then the society. And that's how you work out to bring it about so that we are all off after all, like the Constitution of America says, we're all born equal because we're all, you know,
God's children. We're all human beings from the same source. But it's those things that uh, we need to, to, to look at and change. Great. Thank you, Ashley. I think that's a, a nice uh, question to end with, actually. Michael, do you want to uh, say a few words before uh, we, we open up to networking? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I just want to thank you again uh, for this invitation to engage in this conversation. And the, 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 uh, the conversation that we all just had, I love it. I love that there are folks that are passionately speaking about this. Uh, and I like when we don't get defensive and we, we uh, recognize that we all have an opportunity to improve. And that is from everybody, me personally, to BP, to uh, us as a profession at the bars, we should all reflect on what we can do differently and, and the, the profession we ultimately want to become. Uh, so first, you know, just thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Ian, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the uh, the bar. It's It's been uh, really fun. Well, well, uh, Mike, Mike uh, on behalf of Bakfi and everyone attending here, we want to really thank you for a very thought-provoking and different Denning lecture. I think you've given us all lots of things to think about, lots of ideas. I think it's it's refreshing to have someone from the United States talking to us as well. Um, and I think as an in-house lawyer that's worked for multinational companies, I think you tend to have a different viewpoint than perhaps a, a barrister in chambers. So, so I think it's been really interesting. So, Thank you. I don't know if Lady Hale wants to uh, say something. Thank you, Ian. Yes, I would like to say a very big thank you to Michael for that lecture. I was cheering at almost every point you made. Uh, I mean, particularly about the billable hours culture, which I think has done huge damage. Uh, in the long run, it will do huge damage to the solicitor's profession. Uh, as you were pointing out, and I was delighted to hear that people in your position are say are challenging the firms and saying, "Give us a more diverse team. We want your best talent, not your billable hours talent." And I think that's so wonderful. So lots of the things you have been saying, I have been saying very quietly from a position of complete ignorance, whereas you have been saying it from a position of knowledge. So great, wonderful, and. Thank you to back for putting this on. I think it's been terrific and very, very encouraging to all of us who really care about improving the diversity of the legal profession and therefore improving its quality. Yes, thank you. And I think um, uh, um, so in, in the, in the usual way of uh, thanking uh, Mike, shall we just do a little bit of <laughs> Administrator for uh, organising this evening and for Mark Wealth okay. Management for sponsoring it. Now I open the floor to, open the to, floor to, to comment or, or whatever and have a chat for the next 10 minutes or so. Yes. Um, thank you. May I please say something? Please say something. Yes. 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 Thank you. Can you? Can you? Um, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, um, Wonderful. Um, I would like to please just add on the role played by the Bar Council and the Bar Standards Board. Um, I must, I must say that I do believe that we're not doing enough, and that um, data audits, training diversity just doesn't take it any further. There is a role for data collection, for the audits, for the training. Uh, but we do need to have some practical change. And I think that's what we're looking for as to what are those practical changes and that we can see the face of the bar actually changing. Now, I on the 4th of November even suggested and had a meeting with um, Amanda Pinto and uh, members of the race working group. And one of the suggestions that I had was that can we use Rishi Sonic's uh, kickstart scheme uh, 
uh, and implement it for pupillages to boost pupillages at the bar because pupillages to me are the key. That's the entry point. We're not knocking on doors. You're not uh, uh, speaking at schools. You're not data collecting. Uh, you're not having introductory breakfasts and meetings at, uh, for instance, Norton Rose, but you're actually opening the door to the profession. Oh. Uh, you've gone off on mute for some reason. Sorry, sorry. So mine was that should we not be really looking at schemes like that, the kickstart scheme that is now on the table and ends on the 31st of December to then have a boost to the pupillages from um, from diverse communities. And I got the response then that they would look into it at the meeting that I had, the virtual meeting that I had uh, with Amanda Pinto. That was on the 4th of November. Then at the bar conference as well, I raised that question on the chat line and I got a private message from uh, Sam Mercer who, was, who said, we're looking into it. And um, so my question was not even answered by the panel, and there you had certain members of uh, even the co-chair of the um, race working group. And today is where we're almost at the 4th of December, and I still haven't had any response from the bar the chair, or uh, nor from the um, panel that sat at the annual conference. And I do believe that if we want to change, we have to please look at the entry levels uh, of pupillages. Thereafter, we, can, we simultaneously, we look at then the different levels, the progression within the profession. And that is the work then that has to come in for those members. And then secondly, even then, um, more along the, the rungs of the ladder, uh, whatever that those are, benches at the ends, judicial um, uh, positions. So it becomes a case for me of actually practical changes and seeing the numbers change. And you have to look at targets as well. Uh, chambers, how many members are there actually taking from diverse communities? And that we've got to be able to to couple that with, of course, the audits, the data, the training uh, facilities, but it is the practical changes that we need to make. And I think I'd like to see that happening uh, immediately, actually, because that we can only hear so much of talk shops, data and conferences. The final point that I want to make as well is at the bar uh, conference, even on that race working group, I heard that it's going to take time and it'll take time for 10 years, at least for the bar to change in the face. Now, really, we don't have that kind of time any longer. You know, in 2007, I met with Lord Newberger, even at the House of Lords on uh, diversity training uh, and changes. And there in his report, even that was a bar council report, and uh, there was also that talk. It would take a bit of time and they are certain they are implementation of certain programs. Now we're sitting in 2020 and basically, to my mind, we really have not made much progress at all. And in terms of practical changes, we cannot really say, well, these are the numbers we changed. These are the um, pupillages we offered in, in extra from 2007 to 2020. Now, I don't think we can as, as, the, as a profession and members of what we term an honorable society really say that we're doing anything about diversity, unless we can show that these are the pupillages that we have now offered. These are the judicial appointments. These are the uh, sulks. These are the work that these are the members that are getting the work as well, because it is work that gives you the training. It is work that gives you the skills to then go up the ranks, rungs of those la of that ladder. So I would very much like to know even what is the race group doing about this, my suggestion on the kickstart program scheme. And that scheme ends on the 31st of December next year. And it's something, and I offered as well, because I, I'm, I'm head of my own chambers. I offered then even that, under that scheme, the bar council can take 30 or so pupils, and I will even train those pupils alongside other chambers 
under the auspices of the Bar Council, because that scheme makes that possible, where you could take 30 or even more. But really, for me to have made that suggestion on the 4th of November, until today, not have any word, and then even at the Bar Conference, my question was not taken, and actually, my email to the bar council to the bar council was already sometime earlier than even November. It was sometime in September. I got no response until I insisted on a response, and that came then uh, late October. So I think as much as we want to say we are, we have the will, we are doing things. Really, it's time now that we see change, and it's time we own up and we be honest within this profession. I find that's it. It comes down to honesty. There's self-interest and there's uh, we are doing things. We will do things. It will take time. Really, all that must go out. Truth is a fundamental value of all religions, of all professions, and more so in the law. And we need to be honest with each other and honest within our profession and society. What are we doing? And I really ask, I ask the uh, Bar Council and the working groups to please be accountable to us as members and uh, to the future generation as well. We can't go along at this pace. We don't have this kind of time any longer, nor the patience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else like to make any comments or? Uh... I've already made one comment, but about 25 years ago or so at the annual general meeting i moved a motion that there should be pupillages available for everyone who's called to the bar um, and uh, of course it passed but uh, of course the bar council is not bound by any motions that have passed and so nothing has been done about that but uh, but I, I think in some states in america for example there is no um you don't have to do it uh, after you've passed the, the bar there, you can start practice immediately. I, and it may be that one should sort of look in, into that uh, as well. So, for example, you run the, the, the bar course together with uh, a pupillage so that when you pass and you're called to the bar, you can go into practice. That may have a... a, a the Law Society have already implemented that type of training scheme. Yes. 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 That may well have a game, be a game changer. Mm. Good. Well, it's uh, after half past seven now, so I, I think we sh should uh, close the, the lecture. But thanks again to Mike for a really thought provoking uh, lecture. And it's been a really good debate afterwards, which I think uh, with some very challenging questions. So I'd like to thank the members of the audience that have uh, made such interesting uh, contribution. So um, there will be a Denning lecture next year. We have one each year, so uh, we don't know who the speaker will be next year. Um, but following Lady Hale and uh, Mike, there'll be a hard act to follow. Um, so I'd like to wish everybody uh, all the best for the coming festive season and uh, wish you all luck in the new year and look out for more events that we've got. We've actually got another diversity event we're planning in January. OK, so uh, Thank thanks everybody and have a really good evening. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well done, Ian. Well done, Ian. That's very good. I like all the crashing noises. Crashing noises. Hi, Narendra. Hi, Narendra. Looks like he's frozen. Mm.
Anyway, anyway. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers, 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 cheers. I'll bid you farewell, gentlemen. Yes. Ladies, yes. Yes. take care. Two miles. All the best. Goodbye. Bye, Niles. Well done, Sandra.